All right. We are we are live right now. This is Dan Tomaszewski with Everything MSP. Uh, we'll just give a, a few seconds here as people start entering to the room. Uh, beautiful day here in Michigan, nice and sunny, uh, a little bit warmer than it was yesterday, uh, which is a good thing. It was only in the 60s yesterday, so I uh, can't complain about that. Um, today, I am very excited about our event today. We have uh, two guests that uh, we'll jump into here in one moment. We're going to talk about deciphering cyber insurance for the modern MSP. And uh, as I threw out a quick Facebook Live yesterday, we had a, an incredible call yesterday preparing uh, just our, our final prep call for today. And um, there's, there's a lot to cover. Uh, we have a lot to cover in 60 minutes. We could actually probably spend 60 hours uh, talking about this topic. Uh, but with that being said, we have um, MSP 360 is sponsoring today's event. We have David Gugick, who is the VP of Product Management with MSP 360. David, welcome. Thanks for having us here and, today, Dan. Uh, you know, I'll have you do an introduction, a little bit more deeper introduction of yourself, as well as uh, our second guest, uh, Joe Brunsman, who is... Uh, with Brunsman Advisory Group. Welcome, Joe. Um, Joe is a cyber insurance expert and also has authored a couple of great books that we're going to talk about as well. Um, but welcome, both of you guys. How are you guys doing today? We are good. Awesome. I'm happy to be here. And I just want to say, this is really going to be like the Joe webcast, not really the David webcast. <laughs> Joe has all the really good information that I always love hearing. It's my third time doing a webinar with Joe. I missed the last one, sadly, because I was at an event. So I'm excited to have Joe back educating me and everyone else about insurance. Well, that's awesome. We'll just ride on uh, Joe's coattails and make uh, make David and I look really cool and smart uh, like Joe. So yeah, because we know how to bring Joe into a webcast. Exactly. <laughs> the best. Oh man, when, when you guys are relied on the insurance guy, it's uh, it's a yeah. I know. Whoever thing. thought insurance would be like the fun topic that everybody right. would be right. discussing? I mean, I thought it was insurance law, insurance legal, and um, and tax, uh, you know, tax accounting that are the books you read to fall asleep at night, right? Not anymore. Not anymore. Not right now. Not right now. It's a hot topic. Um, and uh, so with that said, David, you want to uh, jump into some a little bit of intros on yourself as well as uh, Joe? Yeah, I mean, if, for those of you on the webcast probably have seen me before. I work for MSP360. I'll tell you at the very end uh, a little bit about our products that we have in our uh, portfolio. In case you're unfamiliar with MSP360, I really just want to introduce Joe Brunsman and have him tell you a little bit about himself. He's got uh, quite a an interesting background uh including uh what he's doing right now so joe tell everybody a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into it all right so uh let's see kind of the condensed version is uh, i'm a former it myself uh so i like to get nerdy there which is always fun which is why i love talking <laughs> to msps uh, i got my bachelor's from the naval academy in robotics back then it was just called systems engineering and made this super cool semi-autonomous beer launching fridge uh, that my <laughs> then girlfriend, now wife, actually painted like a pinup girl, um, like a 1940s like bomber style on there. Awesome. Now my wife. So I figured that was that was a good sign. Uh, I got my <laughs> master's in cybersecurity law from the Carey School of Law. Uh, currently on my fifth book. Yeah, my fifth book. Uh, this one's going to be all about insurance for MSPs. So uh, like you were alluding to before, if you need help sleeping at night, insurance is a damn good yeah, way Yeah, we're going to gonna talk it. about this more. Let me just interrupt you very quickly, Joe. So for those of you who are on the webcast today or are just watching this recorded, there's going to be a slide at the end with a couple free eBooks that Joe has taken the time to write for everyone and is making them available for everyone. And we're also giving away a, an Oculus Meta Quest 2 VR headset you do need to be online to win. We're going to pull from the active participants at the end uh, and select a winner and we'll ship it to you. So uh, stick around for the end. 
And one other thing to throw in here, um, I, hopefully I didn't see something shiny and you'd already say this, but uh, Joe is a veteran. So Joe, I want to thank you for your service. Just wanted to. Oh, my pleasure. Here as well. Thank you. I had uh, 12 probably much too fun years uh, in the U.S. Navy, and they paid for all my technology education. So that's awesome. Uh, actually, yeah, turned out pretty well. It was a cool time. So that's a pretty cool. I mean, we not only have a guy here that's going to share a wealth of knowledge on insurance, but you get IT as well. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's, that's like the marriage, right? You know, when you take those two components. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's one thing to have somebody understand, uh, you know, another specialty such as insurance, but to be able to get what we do, being that you had been in the business as well, is, uh, is great. So... Thank you with that. All right. So very high level agenda before we just start asking Joe questions. And by the way, I, I, we, we haven't done the housekeeping yet. If anybody on the webcast has a question, uh, click the Q&A panel and let us know what it is. We'll be Dan will be watching it. I'll be looking at it as well. Uh, if you want to chat with each other, uh, go ahead, hit up the chat window. Let, let us know where you're calling in from. If you're in the U.S. or elsewhere, always good to know. Um, I assume everybody on the call is an MSP, but you know, let us know if you are. We like to keep the chat lively. If anybody has any questions, though, use Q and A. So, high level agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about cyber insurance. Well, really, a lot of a bit, and then we're going to compare that to tech error and emissions insurance. Did I get that right? E and O. I remember I used to have to buy that back in the day, which is something very different than your maybe general liability insurance. And uh, Joe will walk us through. The differences between them, who's getting what, and why you probably need it. Um, we'll talk about meeting policy and requirements in order to get insured. Uh, you know what you should do maybe after a cyber event occurs because you got to know what to do. Uh, the role of backup in cyber uh, cyber insurance, and then I'll like I mentioned earlier, we'll wrap it up with the giveaways. A little bit about the MSP three hundred and sixty platform. So I see the chat is going. So I just want to just acknowledge everyone that's in there real quick as we move on. Mm -hmm. Joe, you're the real deal. So says Corey. I would have to agree. Oh, you already thank Corey. I'm going to thank Corey as well. Uh, so a lot of people happy Joe is here. We will send out recordings. Dan always does that. They'll be posted on Facebook, right, Dan? You got it. Yeah, everybody will. Everybody that uh, registered will also receive an email um, with the recording information. And uh, again, it will be posted up on uh, in our Facebook group. Okay, great. All right, welcome Lisa from San Diego, David from Nashville. I was just there recently for a conference, love the town. Uh, Chris is in Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Kansas City. We have West Tennessee and Greensboro, North Carolina and Chicago land. Uh, yeah. Rolling Prairie, Indiana. I don't exactly know exactly where that is, hmm. although Indiana, I think I probably could identify on the map. Welcome <laughs> Annapolis and Denver metro area, Vermont. Oh, I love Miss Vermont skiing there as a as a teenager. Columbus and Centennial, Colorado. So welcome everybody. I'm going to turn yeah. it over to Joe right now. This first slide is about the differences between cyber insurance and your tech E and O insurance. Who's getting what, you know, you, your customers, why you need them, mm -hmm. one or the other, or maybe both, and uh, what they do for you. So, Joe, I'll just let you take it away. All right. So, uh, good to see you. I've actually been to most of these places uh, that people are listing here. Um, so, this is a common misunderstanding. And uh, I will just add, like, for the books, <clears throat> I believe that you go to my website and you sign up for the link. I don't email people that just download my book because I hate getting a million emails as well. So I'm not <laughs> going to bombard you with insurance nonsense. Um, there's a great misunderstanding in the MSP community over what cyber insurance is, what tech E&O insurance is, or maybe they don't know about tech E&O insurance, or they don't understand the difference between the two or really how to structure all this. And as the liability landscape increases, it's more and more important for MSPs to understand kind of these basic insurance principles, right? Or liability principles. So the easiest way to think about this is that cyber insurance actually grew out of tech E&O insurance. All right. So both of these policies have two sides and four buckets. 
the difference is in the first side, right? So the first side, just to kind of broadly explain for both of them, somebody wants money from your business. It'd be regulators, clients, uh, vendors, right? In the terms of PCI DSS, could be some media liability. That's the first side. The second side is what people think of as cyber insurance. Now within that, there's going to be four buckets of coverage. So if you look at a tech e &O quote, or if you look at a cyber quote, and you just see this laundry list of things, and you're like, how do I remember this? How does anybody know what this stuff means? It's actually really simple. So, you know, I've written thousands of pages on the topics of tech e &O and cyber, but it really kind of boils down to the following. The first bucket is going to be data breach slash cyber event. What are you going to see in there? You're going to see attorney, forensics, breach notification, credit monitoring, business interruption reimbursement. The second bucket is going to be ransomware. You'll see a lot of the same coverage features. Attorney, forensics, business interruption, uh, ransom payments, caveat there that we'll talk about later. Uh, dealing with OFAC on the very, uh, was it the fourth slide we're going to be getting into, fourth topic. Then you get into the third bucket, loss of funds. And this is where it kind of starts going sideways. And you really just have to pay attention, right? Both for the MSP and potentially your clients, uh, if they're asking questions here. What does a term like social engineering mean? Or wire fraud? Or invoice manipulation? Those aren't legal terms. They're not even standard insurance industry terms. They only mean what the policy says they mean, right? So just because you have two different quotes and they both, say, <clears throat> they both say social engineering coverage, one of those could be entirely useless and the other could be exactly what you're looking for. So the kind of best practice there is look at your MSP and go, okay, what are we worried about here, right? How are we set up? What are our internal controls? Right, we're probably worried about two major things. We get tricked into wiring our own business money somewhere it's not supposed to go, or bad guy gets into our system, starts tricking our clients or vendors into wiring money, ostensibly meant for us to some bad guy's account. All right, and then the fourth bucket of coverage is what I call miscellaneous but situationally important. And so these could be like standalone events, or most often, these types of coverages kind of play into the other three buckets. So in that bucket, the fourth bucket, you could see things like dependent business interruption, dependent system failure, uh, voluntary shutdown, reputational harm. That's a big one. Uh, those types of coverages. All right. That's kind of just the 30,000 foot view of what you have going on. Now, for an MSP, let's go back to that first side of coverage that I was talking about, right? What's the difference between a cyber policy and a tech e &O policy? Well, it's all about who is trying to sue you for what, okay? So in a tech e &O policy, what's that gonna cover you for on that first side? You allegedly failed to render or inappropriately rendered some professional service to a client, right? So that could be like, hey, uh, hey, you know, MSP, I paid you to uh, have backups for me, right? And then I had a ransomware event. It turns out that for whatever reason, those backups were never created. Because of that, I've been damaged. So I'm going to bring a claim against you, right? That's the first side. That's a tech e &O policy. A cyber policy, cyber policies don't respond to some error or omission in professional services. That's not how it works. Like a cyber policy claim on that first side would be, uh, well, I'm a client of a CPA firm, for example. And that CPA firm, they lost my social security number. Because of that loss, I've had pain and suffering and identity theft. And so I'm going to sue them under the auspices of some private right of action if allowed in the state or a class action claim along with all the other clients, right? So it's not, hey, you messed up a service. It's, I got damaged, I got hurt because of this particular cyber event, 
All right. So with that, that may kind of sound pedantic, but it's really important. So for all the MSPs out there, I would say, one, do not have a separate ENO and a separate cyber policy. There are very few exceptions where that should ever occur, right? Because you're going to have overlapping coverage there potentially, which means long story short, you're going to be paying multiple deductibles. You probably don't have the coverage you need uh, in terms of various definitions. So you just have to be careful there. All right. So for all the MSPs out there, unless you're say like a 10, $15 million MSP and all of your other options are gone, you should not have a separate ENO and a separate cyber policy. Look at your tech ENO policy and specifically look at the definition of professional services, right? That's, that's what you want to look at. Okay. Why is that important? Because that's what they're going to cover you for when a client brings a claim against you. So if that definition's wrong, everything past that point, it, it doesn't matter, quite frankly. There's no question of some crazy exclusion. There's no question of limits or sublimits. It's you don't have coverage. So please go back and just check that definition in particular. Now, so do you think it's more... a check, Joe? You think they're going to be reading it for the first time? It, uh, I, I didn't read my homeowner's policy until <laughs> probably 10 years after, yeah. you know, having insurance, homeowner's insurance to actually go through it to see what was in it. Um, you know, it's like reading a terms of service, <laughs> right? Most people just skip right through everything. So uh, it'd be interesting to know. I don't know if we have a poll question on this, Dan, but if uh, if you're in chat right now and you have you know, tech e and slash cyber insurance. Have you actually read through the policy? Uh, be good to know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dan. No, I was just saying, um, I, I think, yeah, if you could throw that in the chat, we don't have a, a specific poll question on that. But um, so the question I have for you is differentiating yourself as you, you need coverage for your, you know, for your, you as an organization because of the support you're providing to clients but then also the coverage for you as a business, right? So um, segmenting yourself from the fact that you're providing service to clients, um, how do you look at this from that perspective of having a proper coverage to make sure that uh, if you have yourself as an MSP, as a business, have any kind of a, a, a threat or um, a, an incident, I guess I should say. Sure. So Great lead in. Um, we didn't talk about this before, but that's perfect. So let me kind of illustrate an example of a claim, right, that occur that could occur against an MSP and kind of how that insurance would, would come into play. Okay, so let's say a bad guy gets into an MSP and then goes through the RMM, hits the clients of the MSP with ransomware, right? And hits the MSP with ransomware. So everybody got hit with ransomware here. How does this play out under a policy? Well, you have to think initially, right? What's that MSP worried about? All of their internal systems. That's where the cyber side of a tech e &O policy comes into play, right? Those are all internal coverages with some exceptions, but to illustrate the point, right? It's all internal coverages, like your business is losing money, your business has been damaged. Now, that means that your clients need to have their own cyber insurance policy. So if you uh, nerd out like me and you have looked at all 50 different state and territory breach notification laws, they're all actually very similar, right? And we can all blame California uh, circa 2007 because they're the first ones that came up with this. And obviously there was a big uh, lobbying group on behalf of the technology industry in California, but it kind of just makes sense anyways. So MSPs are generally construed as data holders, not data owners, right? Just like, you know, every time something in Azure gets stolen, Azure is not paying for the breach notification and the credit monitoring, right? Kind of same thing generally applies to MSPs. And so what that means is, when we talk about like say data breach or cyber event or ransomware or all those types of coverages, 
right? That's dealing with the MSP internally. Your clients typically have to go out. They need to pay for attorney forensics, breach notification, credit monitoring, et cetera, right? Now, the, the second side of your policy immediately responds to that ransomware event in our example. Now, what happens if those clients all turn around and they're bringing claims, uh, generally said, we'll say lawsuits in this example, against your MSP? Then the first side of your tech E&O policy responds, right? So then it's an E&O claim. So, so in that example, the tech E&O policy could kind of respond to two different things, right? So it's internally dealing with your own ransomware issue and then externally claims brought by clients. Does that answer your question there, Dan? Oh, you're on mute. There we go. I'm on mute. You know, you know, you think it's 2020 or something that uh, <laughs> I'm on mute, but uh, um, no, yes, you, you answered the question. Thank you very much. So before we move to the next slide, Joe, let me just ask you something quickly. Mm -hmm. Is cyber insurance something that MSP should demand say through their MSAs with their customers that their customers have, um, or should they not? Should they just you know leave it up to the customer to decide? Oh, 100%, 100%. So um, I understand a lot of MSPs are very hesitant or nervous to bring up this particular topic. Um, I will say that kind of long story short, without getting too deep into kind of like the legal rationale for this, uh, you don't want your MSP to be the piggy bank every time some end user does something dumb, right? And as a former IT guy and you guys as current IT guys, y'all, it's that end user, right? That keeps everybody awake at night, that no matter what, there will always be an end user who somehow finds a way around every control you have put in place, <laughs> right? And that's, that's always the nightmare scenario. So you don't want your MSP's tech E&O policy being a piggy bank for everybody else. So what that means is just practically internally as an MSP, right? You're saying, hey, clients, you need to have your own little piggy bank there, right? Uh, I do have a video on my YouTube channel called Get Smart uh, Defense in Depth for MSPs. Highly encourage everybody to watch that. Of course, it's free. Um, and you know, with that, you're transferring a lot of that risk back to the clients, right? That's important because instead of a client coming to you with say a million dollar claim or a $2 million claim, where it's all the you know, business interruption costs, the reputational harm, the attorney, the forensics, all that stuff that played into whatever event happened, right? Now they could generally come after you for uh, maybe their retention, which probably won't be that high. Most likely all these kind of vanilla bland uh, business law claims, right? Such as, um, breach of contract, negligence, gross negligence, unjust enrichment. Those are the most common ones we're going to see there. Uh, I have a separate video on my YouTube channel called, I think it's called Watch Before Disaster. Uh, let me see here. Da, da, da. Yeah, Watch Before Disaster. And in that video, I actually look at a real lawsuit against an MSP. And I go, hey, here are the allegations made by the plaintiff what could that MSP have done to fight back against those allegations, right? Primary one's going to be contractual requiring cyber insurance, but there's other stuff that they could do there. And for all the MSPs that are watching, uh, you know, so I, I do a lot of insurance for MSPs and I always get the question, how do I even bring this up? I have a whole video on my YouTube channel called three practical reasons why your MSP requires your business to purchase cyber insurance. And so all the MSPs watching, you can take that information, you can steal it wholesale and just put it in like your own marketing letter. I'm not going to you know, bring a media liability claim against you. I don't care. It's purely for your own benefit or you can use it as talking points, whatever you need to do. Uh, but that's really the safest way moving forward. Because ultimately, once you watch that video, it should be very clear to your client that they actually want all of your other clients to have cyber insurance as well, right? So there's many elements there where it's not just in the MSP's best interest, it's in their client's best interest uh, that they do that. So for all of you who aren't doing it, 52% of you, please make that happen. Yeah, it looks uh, like we had some comments, at least yeah. from a few folks who are looking into updating their MSAs right now. And then one comment from somebody about uh, some New Mexico statutes that may prevent 
MSPs uh, from forcing uh, their customers to get cyber insurance, but they can certainly encourage it through the MSA. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a legal scholar, so I can't answer that specifically for that state, um, but that's good. So, I mean, I think that's, I think if we had taken this poll certainly a year or two ago, those the, those percentages would be very different. So it's good to see that MSPs are now, you know, really updating their MSAs, things that maybe you don't look at very frequently, especially since a lot of smaller MSPs are probably hiring, you know, attorneys to draft their MSAs. And then, you know, they're more of as a, done on a contract basis. And then they don't think to reach out again. <laughs> excuse me to have them updated as the laws change or as a, as you know cyber incidents change and insurance changes you know and i would just add too that um you know i never passed the bar in new mexico right so i'm not licensed to practice law there i'm not i live there but i'm not super familiar with the business law uh in the state of new mexico uh but what i would say is see if you can charge more if they don't have cyber insurance, because frankly, if you're accepting more risk as an MSP, like right. you should be duly compensated for that. Right. Like I, I'll just tell you all of my traditional clients, I'm talking non MSPs, um, you know, people like architects, engineers, CPAs, attorneys, obviously, right. Like you don't just walk into their business and tell them how to do their job. Right, like th that's not how it works. That's how it's generally been perceived for the MSP community. But like, I'm not going to go to an architect and engineering firm and say, "Hey, I want a bridge," and they go, "Okay, well, there's a, you know, 20% safety delta here where we have to over-engineer the bridge." And I go, "Yeah, you know, like I only want 5%. I'm not trying to spend that much money." Right? They're going to kick me out the door. Like, it's just not a thing in any other business community. So, don't be afraid you know, to kind of start putting your foot down as an MSP, because frankly, if you have a claim as an MSP, unless you're big and you have a juicy premium, the odds of you getting insurance next year are like almost zero as they currently stand. Right. So you got to start taking this stuff very, very seriously. Excellent. All right, moving on to slide two. So just to keep everybody, I'm going to, I'm going to get through my slides at the end pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be helpful if we could uh, wrap up Joe's stuff in the next 20 minutes or so, Joe. Sure. So let's just, just, just keep that in mind. Um, otherwise, like Dan said, we'll just be here for a few hours, which probably everybody wouldn't mind. Right. So really the next slide is about getting insured. What do, what do, what do MSPs need to do to meet the policy requirements for these sort of combo ENO slash cyber insurance policies that, that they're going to more and more be looking to get? Sure. So it's, you know, there's kind of two ways to look at this. So there's the MSP side and then there's the cyber insurance side, uh, both of which are going to have an impact on the MSP. So the first thing is for the MSPs, if you're under, say, like five, 10 million in revenue, there's really kind of only three insurance companies left for you uh, in the current market. Now, hopefully that will expand. I'm not super optimistic there. So one of the things you need to start thinking about is, you know, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. So probably the easiest way to put this is all those best practices, cybersecurity controls, administrative controls, physical controls that you would harp on with your clients, please make sure that you're doing those internally. Right. If you're doing that, you're going to meet all the necessary requirements uh, for tech, you know, insurance. Right. With maybe a few exceptions, um, you know, with that kind of basic problems that I've seen is, uh, you know, legacy clients that don't have contracts. That's just got to get fixed. Um, you can't you, you can't work in a world where there's just no contracts because then it's he said, she said, and you're just asking for disaster and insurance companies frown upon that. Uh, I would say maybe to put it lightly, um, you know, with those best practices, you guys know, like, you know, CIS top 18 controls, or if you're mapping to NIST CSF or whatever it is you got to do, um, you know, disaster recovery plans, incident re uh, response plans, you know, I understand you guys are more technical than your clients are, right? So maybe they need a little more guidance there on what those plans could be. Insurance companies want to see that from an MSP. What is it really? You know, it's, hey, 
generally you're going to know what immediate action steps to take. The next step is going to be call the insurance guy, get legal advice, uh, and then move forward from there. But um, as far as your clients go, that's probably the more interesting side of it, quite frankly. Yeah, if I could because jump the... in real, real quick, Joe, mm -hmm. and just mention, um, you know, when you talk about having the, the policies and procedures and the, the coverage set up for ourselves internally, um, I mean, we should be a model, not necessarily the model, but we should be a model for our clients. And that just makes it so much easier for us to be able to have intelligent business conversations, you know, getting outside of the technical hat, but having that, that business hat on, having those business conversations with our clients about this process, because the more um, they see our level of confidence in how we've handled this and how we've put things in place, they're going to be more accepting and they're going to be more um, apt to adopt what we're recommending if they see what we've done. And uh, I think it's just a critical area that we, we shouldn't overlook. So it's, I've used the analogy of, you know, when you're on an airplane and the flight attendant is giving the announcements of in the event of a, 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 an emergency to the, have the oxygen mask on yourself first before you assist others. You have to take care of your own house first before you begin to help others. And if you don't have that in place, then it's kind of hard to give advice to others when you aren't following that same advice. Oh, absolutely. Right. And I, I know it's as a business owner myself, right. I realize there's always that distinction between working for your business and working on your business. So nice. as all the business owners out there, please don't be afraid to just take that time, put it aside to work on your business, right. And go, okay, what else do we need to do internally uh, to make this happen? Uh, as far as cyber insurance goes for your clients, that's really kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, so there's good news and bad news moving forward. So the good news is you can use those applications as a talking point with your clients, right? So you can say, Client comes to you, they go, hey, can you fill out my cyber insurance application? Uh, P.S., please charge for that because you are accepting some potential risk and liability. So don't do that stuff for free. And it takes time, right? So charge for it. Um, with that, I have a whole video on my YouTube channel, right? Of something along the lines of what I wish MSPs knew about cyber insurance applications, right? So that'll help you internally with your own tech E&O insurance application, as well as kind of filling this out for clients take that opportunity for all those no boxes, right? To kind of revisit those controls with clients, right? Necessarily just, perhaps it's just under the auspices of, hey, you know, we've talked about this before. If the insurance company is asking for it, like maybe we should kind of revisit what those internal controls are, what your cybersecurity controls are uh, and move forward from there. Because if you have larger clients, right? Cyber insurance is increasingly mandating specific controls be implemented by those clients. Good news is that makes it easier for the MSP because essentially the insurance company is now your outsourced sales team, right? They're just making it happen. The bad news is, and I can tell you this firsthand, cyber insurance companies are just inundated and understaffed, all right? So you may not see those particular requirements until maybe seven days before, three days before, right? Now, all of a sudden your client's like, hey, can you just implement EDR uh, in the next three days? Like, that'd be great, thanks, right? And then you're kind of like, oh my God, right? And there's so much to do or, oh yeah, we're gonna need backups now, right? Like, I understand you don't just necessarily flip a switch, right? There's more to it than that. Um, or there could be, you know, hey, if there's a uh, CV CVSS score greater than eight, that has to be patched within 14 days, right? Or the no coverage is afforded to your client. So kind of a double-edged sword there where you can see there's going to be some benefits for MSPs where you don't really have to sell anything. Your client comes to you and they're like, hey, I want to buy this and I want to do it right now. Downside is, as we say in the military, uh, simper Gumby, right? You got to be super flexible because frankly, there's not even a lot I can do, right? Like I'm trying to squeeze water out of rocks over here to get these quotes back from these uh, cyber insurance underwriters. And so just kind of keep that in mind moving forward. So if Joe, two have, quick questions that I have 
Is it sure. safe to say, I know you kind of just touched on it, that the insurance companies are going to have a set of requirements that must be met by either the MSP or their customer, depending on who's getting the insurance, in order to not violate the terms of the insurance agreement? Like they have to have backups, they have to have two-factor authentication. Will it be that explicit in a way that MSPs and or their customers mm -hmm. can follow? And the follow-up question is, if MSP customers are now getting cyber insurance, is that likely to generate more project work as the customer says, hey, you know what, we need to have this implemented in order to get fully covered. You're my MSP, you need to make that happen. And is that an opportunity for more billables by the MSPs? It is certainly. So for example, Hiscox Insurance Company, if you want their cyber insurance policy, uh, their new one's called CyberClear. If you don't have MFA, you will not get insurance. Like full stop, no exceptions. It's not 95% have MFA. It's not 99%. It's not 50%. It's everybody has to have MFA, right? Just input. That's just one example. Um, you know, it could be EDR on 95% of endpoints, or it could be, uh, we'll talk about here in a minute, right? If you don't have backups, your ransomware sublimit is drastically reduced. Um, no, I don't, re I don't represent the insurance company to answer a question here. I represent the clients to the insurance companies. Uh, but does that answer your question, David? I, that answers my question. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next slide. And I know we have one more poll coming in. I don't know exactly when it's coming, Dan. Yeah. Um, but um, just, you know, briefly, let's talk a little bit about, mm -hmm. and I know I kind of covered this in my ransomware preppers guide uh, that I did, I, you know, with Dan and uh, his, his members recently, but just from an insurance perspective, what happens after there's a cyber event in the insurance world? Okay, so I have a whole video on this. The gist of it is three things right? Identify, contain, and refrain. Those are the three things I think every MSP needs to keep in mind. What does that really mean? Going back to our conversation about all these state and territory breach notification laws, right? There's the distinction between data holder, data owner. We talked about that. Data holder, kind of what are your general obligations there, right? And I'm not talking about like business associate agreements, which is kind of a, a niche topic area. Um, it's really going to be if you see something, you have to say something, right? So you identify the threat, contain the threat. Does that make sense under the uh, you know, various rules and exclusions found within a tech you know policy? Yeah, right? Like you should be able to say, hey, we saw this activity going, so we shut the server down, right? Or we uh, closed this transmission, whatever the case would be there. Then I think you need to refrain, right? Because you don't want to give even de facto legal advice. You don't want to be on the stand where some plaintiff's attorney is going to say, hey, why don't you tell me where you went to law school, uh, where you decided that you could provide a risk of harm analysis. And you're like, what the hell is a risk of harm analysis? Right? You don't want to be in that position. Um, so you know, part of this is if your client is contractually required to have cyber insurance, or let's just say they have cyber insurance, right? That's where you can tell the client, okay, this is what we did. This is what we saw. This is where our expertise ends, right? Like you really need to have an attorney come in, advise you on all the legal issues because we're not an attorney. You need to have a forensics guy come in, right? Because there's just all kinds of things that maybe there was an exfiltration of data and we just don't see it because we're not forensics experts, right? Or hey, maybe you have an attack loop in your system. So could a client simply tell you to pound sand and they're like, hey, I appreciate the advice, but uh, you know what? Just restore from backups. Can you do that? Sure, right? Do you necessarily want to fire the client? No, nah, probably not. That's where you have to go to your general business attorney and say, okay, I need what we call an exculpatory agreement. It's also a waiver of liability. Right, you can use this for all types of things, right? If your client, for whatever reason, doesn't want to implement a very crucial control, right? What does that waiver effectively say? It says, hey, 
I told them that there was a problem. I offered to help. They're declining to help. Therefore, I shall not be held liable for anything bad that happens moving forward. Now, in my experience, when MSPs have brought this forward to their clients, half the time their clients just go, ah, yeah, damn insurance companies, right? They sign it and they move on. The other half of the time, that gets the attention of the client and they go, okay, maybe this is more serious than I thought, right? This isn't just a sales tactic. It's, oh no, there's potential liability here. So let's revisit that particular control or circumstance or whatever the case may be. So kind of wrapping it up, identify, contain, refrain. Right. And don't, don't be, be afraid an to contact your legal team, which is something even the NIST with their cybersecurity, uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, what do they call it? Their cybersecurity framework talks about um, before you communicate with anyone, have an attorney read at the ready because you're going to yeah, want to yeah. contact them for guidance on who you need to contact, whether it's you know the authorities, whether it's your customers, whether it's the customers of your customers, whatever your obligations may be, and they could be different mm-hmm. state by state. You don't want to do the wrong thing. And it's always good to have legal counsel ready to help. Okay, so last slide before we talk about your YouTube channel and where to go to get more information from Joe, just the role of backups in cyber insurance. I'm sure this will be a little quicker one uh, as we move into MSB 360 mm-hmm. and the giveaways to wrap things up. All right, so the 30,000 foot view of this is, frankly, if you have clients that don't have backups, I would really question if they should be your clients at this point. Well, like, I, I will a- say this, Joe, just from our side, what we used to do an <laughs> annual poll of MSPs, not just our own customers. And I think mm-hmm. when I joined MSP 360 about five years ago, about uh, 80% of customers at MSPs that had managed services were getting backups. Uh, 20% were not. And, Mm -hmm. you know, some of those reasons were the right software wasn't being offered to everyone, but also back then, you know, some customers were politely declining and thinking they didn't need it. And that's changed a lot, at least over the last two years, we see that around 96%, which I sort of interpret as everyone's really getting backup services now. But I have spoken, you talked about exculpatory agreements and what do you do if a client doesn't want. I've spoken to MSPs before who say, you know what, if a client refuses backup service services, we make them sign a waiver saying that, you know, that they're declining a service that the MSP says is super important. And we talked to other MSPs that say, you know what, we, we're okay turning away business from those customers that are refusing what we find to be uh, services that you must have in order to be, mm-hmm. uh, you know, under our protection and under our management. So I know every MSP is going to be different based on, you know, how much money they're making and the revenue and whether or not they can turn away a customer. But um, we've seen a big change, at least from our side in the last few years, in the number of percentage of customers who are getting backup services. So I'm like you, I, I'm hoping it's everyone now. Yeah, I mean, ideally it, it should be everyone. Um, And interestingly, I'll bring up the Hiscox insurance example again. Um, If you do not have cloud-based backups for crucial data, your ransomware sublimit, so it's normally like full policy limits, that gets limited to $25,000 plus a 25% ransomware coinsurance requirement, right? So what does that mean? That means effectively you would blow through that in a ransomware event in like the first, you know, couple hours easily. So it's almost like not having any ransomware insurance at all. And so what we're seeing now, and it depends on the size of the business, what industry that business is in, the insurance company, they want cloud-based backups. They want multiple backups. Um, It's really becoming more of an issue, right? And your client should understand that there could be, for some of those who just, are kind of laggards or they just haven't gotten the point yet, there could be legal reasons why they need to have backups, right? So you could do this for just about any control, frankly. Uh, and that's where people have to go download my book, just it's 500 pages. So just look at the table of contents, uh, recommend damage control, the second one there, uh, unless you have CPA firms as the first one, uh, zip drives. Yeah. Get those zip drives. Um, that, uh, 
you know, maybe they have document retention requirements, right? If they're a CPA firm or there's some like licensed professional, or they fall under reasonable cybersecurity requirements, right? In which case they have to do it. Oh, 8% tape backups. Uh, so you put the funny floppies. answers on there, you're going to get some people, uh, maybe they're <laughs> accurate. I'm sure the floppies are not. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of enterprise tape out there, though. There's been great yeah. investments in tape systems. And if you're an enterprise that has it, I can understand still using it. Yeah, so there's uh, you know, a ton of potential legal reasons. The various breach notification laws, that's a bad term because many of them also have cybersecurity requirements built into them, right? Even if your client isn't under some like federal law, like gram leach Bliley Act or HIPAA High Tech, there's all these state laws out there the state law that applies to your client, it's typically where your client's client is a resident of. It's generally agnostic as to where your client's business resides, right? So there's kind of this whole patchwork spider web of various cybersecurity laws that they could be falling under. So things like uh, all those fundamental cybersecurity controls, MFA, backups, et cetera, et cetera may actually be a legal requirement. So you wouldn't want to give legal advice to your clients. Uh, but what you could do is you could just take my book, take the chapter and say, hey, according to this, like you may fall under this. Maybe you should go ask an attorney, you know, to make sure that your cybersecurity requirements are up to speed because there are potential coverages for regulatory fines and penalties, but it's where insurable by law. And none of us actually know where that is. And I've spent way too much time trying to figure that out. I've asked like the five most brilliant attorneys in this field and they just laugh and they go, yeah, we don't know until the case pops up. So there's plenty of reasons why things like backups, all those other fundamental cybersecurity controls really should be in place. Um, then to kind of answer the last question here, uh, we're talking about waivers, exculpatory agreements, waivers of liability. Um, in that particular regard, go talk to your general business attorney. The rules on those are hyper-specific to the states, right? So like if you're in Texas, you could effectively write it on the back of a napkin. Both people sign it, it's good. That's not going to fly in New York. You might need very specific language inside of it. There's all these issues with if it's against public policy, how far you can go with that. Uh, so I'm not giving legal advice there. Please go talk to your general business attorney and at least have like a stock form, right? To kind of put in your business owner bat belt and that'll help you moving forward. And this right. is a time in which that legal advice is so critical. Um, it is not a DIY. It is not a Google attorney at law. Um, you know, leveraging your business attorney is critical in this case because this can make or break your MSP. And um, we're all here to survive and be sustainable for the long term. And any legal advice that we get is, uh, uh, you know, uh, an investment into our business to ensure the sustainability for ourselves, our employees, and our clients. Yeah. And uh, things like your MSA, your SOW, SLA, that's not general business attorney stuff. That's hyper specific. Um, something like an exculpatory agreement, limitation of liability or liability waiver, uh, any general business attorney should be able to help you with that stuff. Okay, great stuff, Joe. I know Joe mentioned his website a lot, his YouTube channel. They're up on the screen right now. You can head over to thebrunsgroup.com and uh, get access to those eBooks that are listed on the right, or just take a picture with your phone while you're on. Uh, and you can scan those QR codes later for direct links to them. And Joe, as he mentioned, will not spam you. No, I hate that stuff. Or reverse hack you. <laughs> right, no, Joe? none of that here. None of that here. All right. So I want to thank Joe for taking us through this stuff. We really should do this again and maybe just do it more like a extended webinar and spend more time on it. I know I, we could keep Joe talking easily for two to three hours yeah, without a I break or maybe longer. More anyway, more. we have a lot to get through. Did we share the last poll results with everyone, Dan? I did. Yep. Okay, yep. great. All right. 
So thank you for that. Um, I just want to take just a couple minutes to walk everybody through what we do at MSP 360. I know a lot of you are probably familiar with, you know, at least our managed backup software, uh, what we do. This is sort of like my three minute pitch presentation. So I'll try to get through it in about three minutes. Uh, we build all our software ourselves. We built it from the ground up for the MSP community. We wanted it to be powerful because, you know, we need you to do stuff with it to protect your customers. We need it to be affordable and profitable. We want you to buy it at the lowest possible price. And we want you to make money on it because, you know, you're in the business of providing services to customers, but you need to make a profit so you can pay your employees and, you know, retire someday and feed that dog of yours. Um, we back up the platforms that, you know, your customers are likely using Windows and all its desktop and server flavors. We support a variety of Linux distributions, as, of course, as well as Mac OS, both, uh, you know, on Intel, as well as the new, uh, what are the M1, M2 chips, their ARM style platform. We also back up the applications your customers are using. So their virtual environments like Hyper-V and VMware for host level backups. We do still support on-prem exchange, if you have any customers that are still using that, although we see less and less of it, but we do support SQL Server. That relational database is, you know, is as big as it's ever been, whether it's in the cloud or really on-prem itself, uh, those databases need to be backed up. And of course we support hosted applications like Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. Just because they're hosted doesn't mean they don't need to be backed up. They do need to be backed up. That email, contacts, calendar, uh, drive, OneDrive type uh, files that are stored in the cloud, they need protection as well. We make it all very easy to manage through our thin client management interface. There are no server components to install at the customer sites or at the MSP. We host the management console in AWS for maximum uptime. You just install the agents out there and all the data transfers from your customer's endpoints fully encrypted to your own cloud storage. We support all the public cloud storage vendors, so Wasabi, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, Backblaze B2, and Google Cloud. You can use whichever one you want or more than one if you have a need to you know, open a variety of accounts. That way you can pay the lowest possible price for your uh, cloud storage. You get the backups offsite. You can leave them on site as well, as well to adhere to a 321 backup type policy. Um, to make sure those backups are offsite, somewhat air gap through, at least through separate APIs. Uh, we can lock down the backups. If you're using Wasabi or AWS with their immutable object lock features. So if you're concerned about some malware actor getting access to, you know, it's the software and trying to delete backups, they can be fully locked down uh, using object lock features that the cloud um, vendors support. So uh, that's great. If you, if you have worries about it. So you're paying the lowest possible price for our licenses that start at $5 for desktops uh, and you're making the most revenue. That's the goal. Now, we are more than just backup. We spent the last few years writing a few additional products that we are, that are now in the portfolio and a part of the platform and run within the same user interface. We do have our own remote monitoring and management product as well as our secure remote desktop product called that we've renamed recently to Connect. That's how you can do interactive help desk or do unattended uh, server administration uh, for those things that you can't do through the RMM product. Uh, Everything is available for, through our trials and from our website. Um, managed backup, I mentioned, starts at only $5 a month for desktops. I think it's 10 for servers. Uh, Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace uh, start at $1.20 per user per month. Uh, but I think we might be offering some specials there as well. There's discounting built in. The more you spend, the higher the discount. Uh, our RMM product is available at $60 a month per technician or per admin, as you, as you call them. That's for unlimited endpoints. And that includes the MSP360 Connect product as well. Uh, if you don't have a need for an RMM, you're happy with your RMM, you're just looking to replace your remote desktop, that's available. List price for $35 per admin per month with unlimited endpoints. Um, so uh, definitely check us out. Speak to your account manager for uh, the current specials. Check out MSP University, where we post a lot of uh, custom content that's geared towards running an MSP, sales, marketing. Um, I know Dan has seen it. He's used it. He likes it. We hope you would like yeah. it too. This is content we create for free. 
Okay. Yeah, and let me uh, let me throw out just um, uh, some kudos to you guys on this because you know like I, I've talked about before, anytime we add a new product to our stack, um, it's not like we just throw it in there and it's just going to sell or it's just going to be you know fine off the shelf. So whatever you want to say, um, it, it comes down to having the right marketing tools, having the um, all the documentation. And MSP 360 has done an amazing job of pulling that together. Uh, so it's, it's basically a done for you type model. So, you know, right out the gates, you can start promoting um, the solutions available from MSP 360. And, um, you know, to have a partner behind you putting the time, energy and money into developing these tools is huge. And it's a great, uh, great uh, partnership uh, privilege to take advantage of. Go ahead, David. I'm counting number of attendees so I can do the giveaway. Give me one second. How many attendees do we have on? I think it keeps looping for me. Is it is it uh, 40 right now? Yeah? Yep. I think it's looping around as I'm counting, which is why I ended up at 80 and I'm like, that can't be right. Okay, so we have 40 attendees on. Uh, Except for Edward, who's on twice. So I'm going to look for any duplicates there. Uh, and uh, I know some of you may have called in separately from the meeting. All right. So the next slide is if you have any last Q&A, just throw it in chat or in the q and I know most folks haven't been using the Q&A. That's fine. Throw it in chat if you have any questions. Uh, we're going to give away the uh, MetaQuest 2. I'm going to go ahead and say there, oh, we're losing people. If we had a few more minutes, their chances are going to get higher. <laughs> All right. So I think uh, the only one that's on that called in twice, I think uh, we have Ed, Edward, who's on probably for audio and video. Um, so I'm going to assume there's 38 people on. Uh, well, let's just do 39 just in case. So I'm going to do a random number. I'm going to random.org to pick a random number between 1 and 39. The answer is 36, and I'm counting down right now. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 29, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I'm on 36. The winner of the MetaQuest giveaway is Stephanie Hammond. So congratulations, Stephanie. Now, Stephanie... If you're not in the United States and shipping is going to be a problem, we will gladly give you an Amazon gift card equivalent. Uh, otherwise, uh, somebody will be in touch with you. I'll get your uh, email, registered email from Dan. We'll have the marketing team reach out to you to get your uh, address, uh, and we will send that out to you. So congratulations, uh, yeah. Stephanie as the winner for the MetaQuest giveaway. I want to win one of those someday, I hope. <laughs> uh, if anybody has any final questions, as I mentioned, uh, then chat is where it is. Joe's still here, so ask him something. If not, I'm going to let Dan just do a wrap up. Yeah, let's, so let's uh, see if you have any questions. I'm seeing some uh, funny faces out there. Um, questions, questions? Bueller? John Hammond's sister from Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's what's uh? Oh, he's a buddy of mine, Hammond. He works for uh, Huntress. Yes, he does. Yeah, John Hammond. Oh, yeah, John Hammond. Yeah, he is a John Hammond. Yeah, he works. He's a great guy. Yeah, smart. Yeah, went to uh, went, You know what? I, I, you know, why not just throw in that? Yeah, just go check out his YouTube channel, Joe. He's got a good one. Oh, yeah, but make sure to one. check out Joe's. He's got a lot of free content that he wrote for you out there. The man doesn't sleep. It's what he told me before the webinar. That's what the Navy taught him. Right. Why sleep when you can be awake getting stuff done? So be exactly. more like Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Red Bull. He's not promoting Red Bull. <laughs> no, not, not uh, a government I should, promotion. Right. Man, I should get I should get sponsored by those guys. Uh, so get a lot of money. Exactly. Um, Drink yeah, your no taurine. Uh, did I like the new Top Gun? I have actually not yet seen it. I haven't it. seen it yet either. So um, I don't think I've been to the movie since COVID. So I, Norm asked, uh, let's see, Norm asked, which YouTube content uh, content should I watch? 
Uh, oh man, it's hard to say. I've, I've got all of it. You're not sleeping anymore. Didn't we just establish, Norm, that you're going to now not sleep eight hours a night? Yes. Just cut it to six and you get two hours a day of Joe Brunsman YouTube. <laughs> and the beauty- and By the way, you can always go into the YouTube settings and watch them at, you know, one and a half times speed. Right. Yeah. And a lot that of the content a- is, uh, they're nice, short, 15 you know, minute clips. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you know, just 15 minutes, uh, you can eat that up in a car ride. Um, uh, just do it in little chunks and go through all of it. There's a lot of great content. And yes, oh, you want your kids to be quiet during a long car trip, play insurance videos. Yes. <laughs> they will check out quickly. And we so will have... I- Test on tomorrow's Everything MSP call at 12 noon about uh, the content on Joe's YouTube channel. So, uh, Norm, uh, we'll, we'll be ready to ask you questions tomorrow. That's right. Got to get to the watching. Get to the watching. Uh, I would say start with uh, the video called Get Smart Defense in Depth. That's going to be, you know, any, any Yahoo can sell a techie, you know, policy. Like, that's not really the hard part. Well, Ideally, they should be able to do that, I should say. Uh, Really, the most important part for MSPs moving forward is how do you manage risk, right? How do you transfer the risk that you should not be accepting back to other parties? Uh, And that's going to really be the foundational place you should start. So I give you kind of like the legal rationale, and then I get into the actual mechanisms. And then if you still don't believe me, uh, watch my video called uh, Watch Before Disaster, I believe where I show like, hey, here's an actual lawsuit against an MSP. Here were the recommendations or considerations I gave in the Get Smart video. They could have fought directly against those allegations just using those risk management, risk transference principles. So it's, it's not something where, unfortunately, I'm not necessarily just smart enough to come up with this. It's what all of your peers in other white collar professions have been doing for like the last 20, 30 years. It's just, you guys never really had to do that until recently, unfortunately. So should be useful stuff for you. Awesome. Well, Thank Joe and Joe, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you guys both very much uh, for your time and knowledge. Um, as well as thank you to MSP360 for sponsoring today's event mm-hmm. and giving the giveaway to Stephanie Hammond. Um, with that being said, I hope everybody had uh, a, a great, uh, great learning experience here today. Look forward to seeing you guys soon. Have a great day. Peace out, everybody. Pleasure, guys.